Today we're going to be discussing how to find perineural and leptomeningeal spread of tumor. What's the difference between leptomeningeal and perineural spread of tumor? Well, leptomeningeal is cancer involving the pia matter and arachnoid matter surrounding the subarachnoid space. The most common solid tumors that present with leptomeningeal spread are breast cancer, lung cancer, melanoma, GI cancers, and primary CNS tumors, such as glioblastoma. MRI with contrast has high sensitivity and specificity of greater than 70%. Perineural spread of tumor is microscopic tumor cells invading and spreading along layers of the nerve sheath, the perineurium. This can usually be seen with squamous cell carcinomas of the head and neck, statistically, of course, oropharyngeal being the most prevalent. Salivary gland carcinomas, such as mucoepidermoid and adenoid cystic carcinomas. You can see it with some basal cell carcinomas, definitely see it with melanoma, and of course, lymphoma likes to do whatever it wants. As is the case with leptomeningeal spread of tumor, MRI with contrast has a high sensitivity, also greater than 70%. The MRI appearance of leptomeningeal spread of tumor is leptomeningeal enhancement. Some people call it a sugar-coated appearance of the surface of the brain and or spinal cord. This also presents as hyperintense flare signal within the sulci along the surface of the brain. Perineural spread of tumor presents as nerve thickening. If you're looking especially at CT, it can be foraminal widening around that nerve. There can be subtle loss or infiltration of the perineural fat. And especially you would like to see abnormal enhancement of the nerve and around the nerve, including that uh, infiltration of the perineural fat. Case one, this is a patient with a history of nasopharyngeal squamous cell carcinoma. So you're looking for hyperintense flare signal on the surface of the brain, especially if you see it with nodular enhancement. So take a look for yourself first. On this flare sequence, we see this subtle hyperintensity along the surface of the pons and along the cerebellum. And if we look at the post-contrast images, we can see subtle nodular enhancement in these same areas. So this was leptomeningeal spread of nasopharyngeal squamous cell carcinoma. Case two, this is metastatic urothelial carcinoma. Again, taking a look at the flare on the left side of the image, you're looking for any abnormal hyperintensity where it's not supposed to be. If you see subtly here, there is bright signal within Meckel's cave, which should just be filled with CSF. We know that cranial nerve five is traversing its way through there. Then if you look at the post-contrast images, you see the same nodular enhancement within Meckel's cave along a cranial nerve five. So this is leptomeningeal spread of metastatic urothelial carcinoma involving cranial nerve 5 in Meckel's cave. Next, we have a case of a poorly differentiated squamous cell carcinoma of the masticator space. This one you can see on the flare image is this irregular mass in the infratemporal fossa. On post-contrast images, you can see it has irregular peripheral enhancement and necrosis or cystic change within its center. Then, again, you go back and look at that flare and you see this abnormal bright signal where there should just be dark CSF in the right Meckel's cave. And on the post-contrast image, you see nodular enhancement where it should just be CSF and cranial nerve 5. So in this case, this is direct perineural invasion of cranial nerve 5 from an infratemporal, poorly differentiated squamous cell carcinoma. Case 4. We have a parotid carcinoma with facial nerve perineural invasion. On this flare image, you can see a normal parotid gland on the left side. On the right side, you have an infiltrative mass involving the superficial and deep lobes of the right parotid gland. And since we know the facial nerve courses through the parotid gland, we know to look at the post-contrast imaging and focus on the internal auditory canal looking for any abnormal enhancement of the geniculate ganglion, this triangle shape right here that looks bright on the T1 post contrast, as well as the facial nerve, the intracanalicular portion, which is here in the IAC. 
until it reaches the geniculia ganglion, the facial nerve is considered part of the CNS and should show absolutely no enhancement. Once it is past the geniculia ganglion in the stylomastoid foramen, it is now peripheral and it is allowed to enhance. So any enhancement of the facial nerve within the internal auditory canal is automatically abnormal. So that is what you're looking for when you're looking for perineural spread of tumor from a parotid process. Case five is a patient with a history of metastatic melanoma. What you see on the brain MRI on the flare is you see abnormal hyperintense flare signal within the sulci. In fact, there's a nodular component when you get more peripheral. Then on post-contrast imaging, and this is where I see most people have mistakes, is that you can see what looks like very vascular enhancement on the surface of the brain, but it's way too much enhancement. You're seeing this contrast within every single sulcus and the areas where it looks a little bit hyperintense and nodular on flare, it's also nodular on the T1 post contrast. If you're not sure, take a look at the sagittal T1 post contrast image. You should not see vascular enhancement along the surface of the cerebellum. You should not see vascular enhancement outlining the surface of the brainstem. And this is way too much vascular enhancement. So when you have diffuse leptomeningeal carcinomatosis, i.e. diffuse leptomeningeal spread of tumor, I have seen this called as normal because people think it's just vascular enhancement on the surface of the brain. So be sure to take a look at the flare. It will be your best friend in making this diagnosis when somebody has diffuse leptomeningeal spread of tumor. All right, case six, I'm not gonna give you the history, but this is how you determine if you have true neuroradiologist credibility, AKA street cred. So we have a coronal CT showing a process going on in the right maxillary sinus. It looks like some circumferential mucosal thickening. And if you use your neuroradiologist eye, you can see a mass involving the gingiva of the right maxillary region, extending up there, superficial to the right maxillary sinus, right here. And you can see that the right infraorbital nerve the foramen is bigger on the right as compared to the left. So that should already make you suspicious on CT. And here's the finding on axial CT. You see enlargement of that right infraorbital foramen, whereas here's a normal one on the left side. So that asymmetry should give you a clue that something else is happening. So you see that asymmetric enlargement of the right infraorbital foramen. And then you recommend the MRI to prove what you think is true. And despite the fact that the patients tend to move on these, on the coronal T2, you can see that right infraorbital nerve is twice the size of the left infraorbital nerve. You can see this malignant process involving the maxillary gingiva. And you can see that mucosal thickening in the maxillary sinus. Then you go to the coronal T1 fat sap post contrast and you can see enlargement and asymmetric enhancement of that right infraorbital nerve as compared to the normal left side. Here's the same thing on the axial T1 fat sap post contrast. And so that is how you find perineural spread of tumor in a more subtle area, finding it originally from the CT and then recommending the MRI to confirm your findings. So you can look for widening of the neural foramina to give you a hint that something might be going on with the nerve. Thank you for attention. I hope you enjoyed this quick review of finding leptomeningeal and perineural spread of tumor.